Hey, what's up? This is Shayla's 89, and we are back with some more animation. Scary animation, that is. Um, so this is Sion. Uh, Sion. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Uh, hopefully I am pronouncing it right. The story is called Scary Dolls Story. In middle school, me and my best friend were obsessed with filming haunted places. We pretty much explored every haunted place in the city, but never saw anything interesting. We were wandering around the woods, when we came across a house that looked abandoned for a long time. We were stoked at the idea of a new adventure, so we decided to go in. The doors had locks, but we were able to get rid of them rather easily. We walked into the house and looked around with our flashlights. Although it was dark and somewhat old, the house wasn't in bad condition. The closets were still filled up with clothes, the fridge was filled with rotten food, and there were still family photos hanging up. As we investigated the place more, we realized the house didn't look like it had been moved out of, but just straight up abandoned. I paused for a second and looked at one of the family photos. Something about it just gave me the utter creeps. Without me noticing, my friend had wandered into a room while I was staring at the family photo. I heard her scream and ran to where she was. I don't know why, but she was completely freaked out. I turned my head to the corner of the room and saw something extremely unsettling. It was a porcelain doll sitting on a rocking chair. The doll had glossy blue eyes, blonde well, not hair, be like the boy. and a fluffy dress. Normally, creepy dolls don't bother me, but this doll had a huge crack on its cheek, and nothing about it seemed like a little girl would love. Why would I feel like this doll used to be the little girl that was in that picture, who, got, who was turned into a doll, or something like that? To play with it. As I was looking at the doll, the chair began to rock back and forth. Me and my friend glanced at each other, both knowing no sort of breeze could have gotten into this room. The chair suddenly stopped rocking, and that's what prompted us to get out of that creepy house. You think? Later on when we watched the recording at home, we noticed the doll's head move slightly when my friend entered the room. We tried to research the house to see if there was any sort of backstory, but we couldn't find any. Neither of us had any sort of idea on why there was a creepy doll there. A couple of nights afterwards, I was getting ready for bed when my best friend called me. I picked up the phone, and she sounded panicked. She started to explain what happened. She was home alone when the doorbell rang. She opened the door, and saw something on her welcome mat that terrified her. The doll? The porcelain doll of herself. I was creeped out just hearing her explain it. Oh. And told her to come to my house as soon as possible. I heard a knock on my door as soon as I hung up. Don't open that door. I opened the door, ready to greet her, when I had a horrifying sight instead. Told you. It was a porcelain doll of me. Mm -mm. Who was making them dolls? Please do press the bell icon. Okay, hey, zombies and skeletons. I'm gonna go Halloween party. This story is called the Elderly, Elderly Woman Scary Hospital Story Animated by I am our scary tale. Scary tales. <laughs> Again, after subscribing to the channel, cause I have lots of interesting stories to tell you. It would be great if you like and share the video as well. I had cared for an elderly woman with no family who came to us when her husband died. She didn't speak often, but when she did, it was usually just words that made no sense together. I felt so bad for her because ever since she had arrived, so many of the residents in the area that she seemed to enjoy spending time with had passed in such a short time span. She put up a picture of each of them next to the picture of her husband and several others who were probably family to remember them. I had always just felt sorry for her and showed her extra attention that we eventually became close. It just seemed so unfair that she had such luck and kept losing people she cared about. One day she looked at me and said plain as day, sweetie I think I'm done now and handed me a picture. It was a picture of me and I smiled because it touched my heart that I was that important to her. She passed away nearly a week later and I cried for days. It hit me really hard. 
She knew it was the end for her, and she said goodbye as best she could. A little less than two years later, I was talking with a colleague, and that elderly woman came up in the conversation. My colleague referred to her as that crazy bitch, which seemed very out of character for her, and it shocked and offended me deeply. I expressed this to him not so nicely, and he looked at me with. But why would she call her that, though? You see her as a nice woman. She saw her as that crazy heifer. Why would she be seeing that, though? His shocked look and said, Oh dear, do you not know? And then explained something to me that I had not known. As it turned out, it came out after some time she had passed that she had killed her husband by poisoning him. And that there was an investigation because it appeared that she had a ritual of befriending someone, obtain a picture of them, and hiding the picture until she could kill them, usually by poisoning and then displaying a picture as a sort of trophy. After listening to this, I was shocked. I was she thinking was about the picture of mine she had given to me. It meant that her next victim was me, as I was the person who was close to her. I let that go. I didn't think much about it. It was my night shift. I was in the same ward in which elderly woman used to stay. It was a different patient in there this time. He was sleeping. When I got into the ward, I was thinking about the elder woman. And at that moment, she appeared in front of me. What the? She was sitting on the chair where she usually used to sit. She had my picture in her hands. I was shocked. And within four to five seconds, she disappeared. This was some kind of hallucination I thought to myself. Maybe my mind is playing no. some tricks with me. I went out of there. Whole night and on my way home, I was only thinking about the incident that happened to me in the hospital. When I reached home, I tried to find the picture which elder woman had given to me. To my surprise, the picture was missing. And then all of a sudden, my room's light started to flicker. This was scary. I just ran out of my house. Luckily, just out of the house, there was a police station. I ran into the police station. I explained my situation. Police did investigation but didn't find anything. They couldn't do much as the woman was already dead. After the series of these incidents, I felt paranoid to work in that hospital and also to stay at my home. Due to mental issues, I just left the country. I shifted from Canada to Australia. It's been 10 years now. I have never seen the elderly woman after that. And I hope I will never see her again. She did something to you. I don't know what she did, but she did something. Okay, so this one's called Back to School True Horror Story Animated by Horror Shorts Party. This happened to me a couple of years ago in my senior year in high school. It was the beginning of the fall semester and I was 17 years old at the time. I didn't really have any friends in high school. I guess I was what you would classify as a loner and a class nerd. But I didn't really care as it would help keep my grades up. One day I remember sitting in my math class at a random spot when I noticed this weird guy sitting right across from me. I can't really disclose his real name, so for the sake of the story, we'll call him Tom. Tom was notorious for being super weird and having no friends at school. Sort of like me. Except I would be the type that you would call independent or introverted. Tom, on the other hand, was just completely strange and awkward. I would see him sometimes talking to himself in the hallways, during class, and even in the cafeteria. One day I even saw a guy in our class bullying him while a bunch of other students circled around and laughed at him. A part of me always felt bad for Tom, but the other part of me knew that I would get beat up if I tried to jump in. One day during lunchtime, I remember being in the cafeteria and saw him sitting by himself. I remember feeling pity for what I saw him go through the other day and sat across from him. I remember introducing myself to him, and he looked up and gave me this psychotic stare. His face then turned from just an innocent stare to a weird and creepy smile, almost like he was excited to see me. I instantly regretted sitting next to him, 
but knew it would be rude if I got up and walked away. He then whispered something to me, but I couldn't hear him. I asked him to speak up. He then whispered again, but this time I was able to pick up some of the words he was trying to say. He asked me what my favorite food was. I told him I'm not a picky eater and would eat anything. He then said, me and you were meant to be friends. I found this really disturbing that he would make such a bold statement after barely making any of what seemed like a seamless conversation. I took the higher approach and said, yeah, nervously. He then asked me if I was interested in playing with him. I assumed he was referring to video games as he didn't look like the type to play sports. So I said, sure, you play video games? He then said no and chuckled profusely. I found his response extremely bizarre and asked him what he wanted to play. He said if I was interested in playing with balls. I asked him, <laughs> what do you mean? Basketball or soccer? He then started giggling and then gave me this weird and creepy smile. He's weird acting for a reason, honey. He wants you to play with balls and it's not and it has nothing to do with a basketball, tennis ball, baseball, softball, whatever ball. It's not having to do with sports. Completely ignoring the fact that I just asked him a question. At this point, I 100% regretted sitting next to him yeah, and found the whole situation should've. awkward as hell. I then told him I had to use the bathroom and excused myself without any hesitation. Later that same day, one of the most disturbing things happened to me. It was the end of the school day and I was in the library searching for some textbooks for my semester classes. I remember scanning through some of the books and saw a gap between the shelves, and I saw someone staring dead at me from the other side of the aisle. It was Tom, and he gave me the same creepy stare he did in the cafeteria. I shouted from the top of my lungs uncontrollably and looked away for not even a second, and I didn't see him there anymore. I went to the other side of the bookshelf to see if he was there, but no, he was gone. I remember feeling sick to my stomach and immediately went home after that. The next day I was getting ready for school and remember turning on the radio. I put on our local station and heard breaking news that one of our students from our school went missing. I wasn't able to catch the disclosed name of the missing student as I only caught the tail end of the radio broadcast but was well aware of the news. Later that day, I remember sitting down in the cafeteria at the very same spot I was in when I had the creepy encounter with Tom, except Tom was not there this time. I assumed he didn't show up at school that day, but a part of me was relieved because I didn't have to deal with the awkward and creepy encounters. I even pondered the idea of Tom being the missing person I heard earlier in the radio broadcast, but the thought eventually left my mind. At the end of the school day, I went back to the library to find the textbooks I was initially searching for the day before. I was relieved that I didn't have to worry about Tom creeping up on me from behind the bookshelves again. It was pretty late when I left the library, and when I arrived home, I saw a cardboard box on my front porch. The box had my name written with a black sharpie on the front, and had a greeting card next to it. I found this super sketchy as I didn't order anything on eBay nor do I have any gifts mailed to me due to my lack of acquaintances. I brought the box and the card into my house and went directly to my bedroom. I set the box on my bed and started immediately reading the greeting card. It said, To my friend who is not a picky eater and will eat anything, sincerely, your best friend. I recalled exchanging those same exact words with Tom in the cafeteria. I started panicking. Oh. I knew this had been... Please don't let this be balls or anything that I'm thinking. Please don't let it be any body part that I'm thinking. From him, and how the hell did he know where I lived? I was utterly terrified of what you. contents may be lurking in the cardboard box. As I started opening it, my heart dropped, and I screamed at the top of my lungs. Two eyeballs and a puddle of blood sat inside the box. I sprinted downstairs and immediately called the police. It was later discovered that Tom ended up killing the boy that bullied him at school. The bully was the missing person that I heard in the radio broadcast the other day. Tom was later arrested and sentenced to prison. As for the bully, his remains were found in Tom's fridge, in individual pieces all in Tupperware, 
Ever since that day, I can't sleep. Oh. I don't know why he kept those remains in the fridge, but part of me wants to know what exactly his intentions were. wasn't keeping an eye on you. I mean, in a way he was, but he was more keeping an eye on him. Why did you have that creepy mask on? Sorry, turn around. Ten victims were you a cannibal? Your whole family's freaking weird. Cannibals. Oh, buddy. This one is called My Son is Trying to Kill Me by Stranger Stories. Never miss another strange story. Subscribe and hit the bell. Sit back. And get comfortable. I have a few stories to share with you. Everything hurts. My thoughts are scrambled by a droning sound resembling millions of cicadas buzzing around in my head. And my body is broken and destroyed. I'm dying, but the Reaper is taking his time getting to me. My distressed son paces in front of me, what did you do to holding the shotgun he used well, to turn everything below my kneecaps Ew. into pink mist. He's crying and babbling like a baby, and I don't blame him. If I had chained up and shot my parents in my basement, I would be a mess too. It's not my fault. I didn't want to do this, he mumbled to himself. I needed to do this. 
I told them not to leave the house for any reason. And what did they do? They do exactly the opposite of what I told them. I know he isn't speaking to me, but it doesn't sound like he's talking in his own words either. He turns and looks at me. I'm sorry, Mom. Tears screaming down his face. He reaches into his pocket and pulls out two shotgun shells. Under any other circumstances, I would be screaming and pleading for my life. But now, my throat is far too dry to do anything but let out faint wheezes. He takes aim at my head, just like he did oh with his father yesterday. He had always loved me more. Yesterday, when my son shot my husband, he probably didn't even see him as human. Part of him was likely happy he was killing his dad. After the years of neglect, I can't really blame him. But I was not my husband. Through the years, I filled the void my husband's apathy created. And my son loved me for that. And now, so he's going to shoot me in the head. <laughs> no, he screamed as he threw down his gun. I traced him as he walked back and forth in the basement. He was having a change of heart. You're my mother. I don't know why I thought you would hurt me. I don't know why I'm doing this. I love you, Mom. He again walks over to me, and I begin to panic. I wanted to tell him to stay away. I wanted to croak out my death wish. I wanted to turn away as he embraced my body in a hug. But I failed. As he kissed my cheek, I unwillingly returned his favor by using the burst of adrenaline and hatred the infection gave me to take a bite out of his face. If my body was still mine, I would have been bawling my eyes out. But my body was no longer mine. And soon, my sons wouldn't be his either. Wait, 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 wait. I wanted to croak out my... What? <laughs> what? Death wish. I wanted to turn away as he embraced my body in a hug. But I failed. As he kissed my cheek, I unwillingly returned his favor by using the burst of adrenaline and hatred the infection gave me to take a bite out of his face. If my body was still mine, I would have been bawling my eyes out. But my body was no longer mine. And soon, my sons wouldn't be his either. He stumbles back in pain and confusion beginning to convulse the infection so you were infected and you were slowly dying in the chair and you turned into a whole zombie that turned your son son okay son son to a zombie okay. he's taking hold of him as i fell back defeated i cannot feel guilty all i can feel is the buzzing controlling my broken body and now, his. Alrighty. Okay. So how was your son trying to kill Oh. It's all trying to kill you because you were infected. And he didn't want you to leave the house because there was something going on. Because you got bit. And his father or stepfather or whatever must have got bit, but he could easily kill his father. He couldn't kill you because you took care of him. And that's something that he took to heart. Okay.
Next story Jen and her is... husband Dan were at the supermarket. Oh, let me say the story, please. Next story is a crazy woman trying to take my baby at the supermarket by Stephen D. Yep. When their baby was being especially fussy, he took her for a 10 minute drive to calm her down and came back into the parking lot waiting for Jen to finish shopping for groceries. Dan was taking a business call and sat down absentmindedly rocking the baby when a woman approached them. It's not uncommon for people to ask to play with their baby. She's got big rosy cheeks, soft wisps of gold hair, and the most adorable gursly toothless grin. But her nap schedule was paramount, so he was preparing to tell the woman she actually couldn't play with the baby right then. She walked over, brimming with confidence, and before Dan could even finish his sentence, she picked up the carrier and started walking off. Excuse me, Hafa. Who was you and how you gonna sit there and just pick up somebody's baby and walk off with it? And how you just let him, let her take it, take your baby? If you don't bop her upside her head, not like punch her, just like mush her upside her head. Dan was in shock and said, excuse me, put her down. She started walking away, away more briskly. Her. Dan tried to grapple the carrier out of her hands, resulting to restraining her arms. This woman yells, help, he's trying to take my baby. Kidnapping, 911, help. Kicking him in the shin and pulling a pink bottle of pepper spray out of her handbag. Unsurprisingly, no one in the parking lot was clocking the earlier interaction and assumed he was really a kidnapper. Immediately, a man knocked Dan to the ground and was holding him That's down, stupid. telling him that the police was being called. He was telling everyone in the parking lot it's his daughter. You just as stupid because if you would have looked at the baby and then looked at him, they looked just like with the hair color, stupid. But no one was listening. I have pictures of the baby on my phone. This, however, didn't translate well because everyone interpreted as him having stalking photos of the baby. It was at this point that another man kicked Dan as hard as he could in the ribs. At this time, Jen came out of the store and she thought he was being robbed by these people. She was yelling for security, panicking. And when she saw that her baby was being held by a woman, she was relieved. Jen thought maybe her daughter no. was moved out of harm's way whilst her husband no. was being robbed. She couldn't find a security guard outside the store and so she ran up to the people holding her husband down, waving her wallet, pleading, take everything you want, just, just leave us alone. The man said, Lady, we need to wait for the police to deal with him. Jen was confused as to why muggers have caught have the police. What do you mean? What are you talking about? And made out someone saying, He tried to abduct that woman's kid. Her husband would never hurt a child. She kept trying to understand what the man was saying and suddenly, it all clicked. She looked around for the woman who had her baby and she was halfway across the parking lot. Uh, she Jen went ballistic and sprinted across what? right to her. All she could think to do was to grab the woman by her hair and squeeze her throat with her other arm. She yanked her hair as hard yep. as she could and that was Beep. enough to make her drop the carrier. She was so scared and surprised she threw herself on top and when she looked up, the woman left. Not one person tried to stop her, and within the next couple of minutes, police had arrived. So they just there were still several bystanders who explained it as her husband trying to kidnap the baby. The police's first questions when asking for her description weren't investigative. They were questions thinly veiled trying to convince Jen not to pursue charges, still placing blame on her husband. Do your husband and the baby look dissimilar? Is there a chance she thought he was abducting the baby and she was trying to intervene? Could your husband have been doing something inappropriate or violent to the baby that would make her feel compelled to extricate the baby from the situation? Did she seem groggy or confused? Could she have mistaken either of them for her own family members? They spent more time verifying that the baby was actually Jen's instead of focusing on the kidnapper. Her husband had caught his brother at that point who works in an office with a lot of lawyers and connected with one ASAP. And they gave him the priceless advice to get every officer's name and badge number, to request copies of the store's security tapes right away, and to escalate the complaint higher up the chain if these officers weren't taking them seriously. Finally, Jen and Dan had enough reason to believe they were being taken seriously, and they went home. 
Dan was seething with rage and grappling with a feeling of helplessness from how little he was able to do, and has two cracked ribs from when the man kicked him. There were still people who stuck around to talk to the police who were giving the husband dirty looks, and one man even implored the police to involve CPS to verify that it was really their baby. Hey, so to the parking the lot babies? kidnapper and the parking lot skeptics, the the they better like hope them. that Jen and Dan never sees them again. To the officer's credit, they did ask if he liked press charges. After weighing the pros and cons of the situation, the couple got in touch with the police and decided to move ahead with press charges with the two men involved in anything beyond basic restraints. To set an example, but these men made the wrong decision, even if they did come from a well intentioned place. Come. Look at the child, and then look at the father, and then look at that lady. If the baby does not look nothing like that lady and more like the father, then obviously it was the Hello. Put it together. And you're right. I would have pressed charges on them too, sitting there abusing me for something. Now I'm sitting there trying to protect my daughter. The and that woman would have been dead. Sitting there touching my kid. Anyway, we're going to move on. So this is the layer teller. It's true graveyard horror story. Whoops, whoops. My name is Justin, and this incident happened with my cousin and I almost a year ago. Last summer, my cousin Martin came to stay with us for a few weeks. The weather was awful, so we were stuck in my room most of the time playing games. It was fun at first, but I soon got fed up with it and wanted to do something outside. I needed to come up with some way to get Martin away from wrecking more of my stuff. We were alone at the house. My parents had gone to stay the weekend by the beach, so I suggested Let's do something outside for a change. But he complained that it's raining outside. But I told him that it's all part of the adventure. Come on, let's go crazy. But he said no again. Then I gave up. All he wanted to do was just sit at home and play games. After a while, the rain stopped. Okay, now can we go outside? I got an idea. Why don't we look through your dad's telescope? I wasn't sure. It was pretty expensive. Besides, it was in his study and I wasn't allowed there. The whole idea was to do something outside. So let's bring the telescope outside. Let's see what we can explore. Nope. My dad's gonna kill me if something happened to it. Relax. I know what I'm doing. I have one at home. I finally agreed Dude, because I was desperate to drag him outside here. the house and told him that we need to be very, very careful with it. In a flash, Martin was briskly walking out the front door with the tripod and telescope over his shoulder while I raced around the house making sure all the windows and doors were locked. We walked a few miles until we found an open space upon a hilltop. The sky was cloudy, but there was great viewing distance. We set up the telescope and pointed at the clouds. The clouds were moving fast. I told Martin that the sky will clear up soon enough. As I was about to look through the telescope, Martin snatched it from me and pushed me aside. At that point, so you get I was really hook. regretting bringing the telescope. In the lens, Martin saw a stone wall. Oh. 
What's down there? Small cemetery. I don't see a church. Don't they have to have a church nearby? Not necessarily. There was one, but it collapsed a few years ago. Martin left the telescope and started sprinting down the hill towards the cemetery. And leave him there. Hey, where are you going? Don't worry about him. Leave him there. He didn't turn around and instead shouted. Just follow me. Nope. But what about the telescope? Take it at home. Oh, Take it home. man. I lifted the telescope and jogged after Martin. The rain had made the mud slippery and I feared for my life if I slipped and telescope got damaged. Eventually, I got to the bottom of the hill, but there was no sign of Martin. You should have went on home. I walked up to the stone wall and stared into the dark graveyard. Martin! Martin, where are you? Get lost. <laughs> Let's go explore inside the graveyard. Will you explore in the graveyard? No, I'm fine here. Martin rolled his eyes and left. I was standing alone in the dark. It was very quiet. Oh. Oh. The only sound I could hear was the stirring of the leaves. his scream, I left the telescope and ran into the graveyard to search for him. I found Martin standing in front of a small tombstone. Are you alright? What? Yeah, I'm fine. But check this out. He pointed at the name on the grave. Alta Loon. I was struggling to catch my breath. <sighs> you have to be kidding me. I thought something happened. No, but you're here now, aren't you? Martin's attention went back to the grave. What the hell kind of name is that? Martin took a permanent marker out of his pocket. Oopsie. I watched with an Stop open mouth as Martin scribbled huge block letters on the tombstone. Sister Smith on a grave. No, this Who's Molly? You or you. My ex-girlfriend. Oh, that's so disrespectful. What? It's just a stupid grave. I seriously didn't know what to tell him. Oh, let's just go home. It's too late. Nah, and in panic, here. I left the telescope outside the graveyard because of your stupid prank. See? I would have kept him there. We were exhausted by the time we reached home and went straight to bed. I fell asleep as soon as I hit the bed.
I'm like, don't wake me up with some BS that you did. You deserve what you got. Probably right next to you. I heard a loud scream and woke up. I got out of bed and ran towards his room. I turned on the light. Martin looked all spooked and sweaty. I asked him what happened. She was in my room. Who? The woman from the grave. I was sure this was one of his pranks and didn't believe him until I saw the marks on his neck. It was bizarre. All I knew that Martin may be a prankster, but he couldn't do that to himself. Disrespect of the grave. So he stayed up the rest of the night, searching online for how to remove permanent marker stains. Apparently, rubbing alcohol over it removes them. The first thing in the morning, Martin went back to the graveyard and cleaned the tombstone. He paid his respects to the dead woman Good. and asked for forgiveness. Yeah. And Got since it. that day, nothing weird happened to him. Hi everyone, hope you all enjoyed the story. As most of you might know that my channel was facing some problems recently, but everything is good now. I went through a really hard time, but because of the support of all my loyal and absolutely amazing fans, my channel was saved. I'm so happy and thankful to you all. Good news for my Russian fans, I'm opening a new channel called Thriller Teller Russia where you can watch these stories in Russian language. The link is in the description so don't forget to subscribe to that channel and press the bell icon for notifications. And a big thank you to my star subscribers for supporting me on Patreon. Your contribution goes a long way. Thank you so much. Don't forget to post your comments and follow me on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook where I post sneak peeks of my upcoming stories and much more. So I'll see you soon with another creepy story. Until then, bye! Okay, so this next story is called... Before we get started, make sure you're... This one is called The Late Night Passenger. Riot Share Horror Story. This has to do... It was in her podcast about in Indian India stories part two. So this is about a boot. And a boot is basically a spirit who doesn't know they're dead just yet, like a recently deceased spirit. And how you would notice one is that their feet backward. They're hovering over the there because the ground the earth ground is too sacred for them. And some other stuff, but I only know from what I heard. Subscribe to Snarled and the bell is turned. Let's, let's get to this story. Best fiends. And now, back to the show. Hey, I'm Sapphire. Wanna hear something scary? Beware the bullet. The following story was inspired by Sia. It was Kai's first day driving for the rideshare app CarShare along the streets of New Delhi, India. He'd recently lost his job and needed to make money while looking for a new one. But he had driven around all day and had not received a single passenger. Tired of wasting his gas and his time, he was about to turn the app off when he finally got a notification. A woman named Sia was looking to be picked up in a sort of sketchy area of town. Kai really needed the money, so he accepted the ride and headed over. His GPS led him to a poorly lit, creepy block with nothing but abandoned warehouses. After looking around for a couple minutes, he finally saw a woman, but she was walking further and further away from the original pickup spot. 
She matched the picture on his app, and so he drove up to her and rolled his window down. Are you Sia? He asked. The woman stopped walking and looked at him. She was a bit shaken and confused, but she nodded. He gestured for her to come in, and she slowly opened the door and sat in the passenger seat. How are you this evening? Kai asked. Sia just continued to stare ahead of her. She was rubbing her neck nervously. Then she began patting down her body as though looking for something. After a couple more moments of silence, she finally spoke. Shit, I, I think I lost my phone and my bag. She spoke slowly, slurring and stumbling on her words. She looked at Kai. Um, what I think has happened to her either is that she got drunk or she got drugged and killed. I don't, I don't remember calling a car. Oh, is that not you? Kai pointed to the photo on his phone. Mm, no, that's definitely me, Sia confirmed. I just, um, I don't, I don't know where I am. We're in the warehouse district, Kai replied. What were you doing over there anyway? I, um, I think that I, uh, I think I was taking a shortcut. Yeah, I think I was taking a shortcut home. I don't remember. Kai was beginning to get a little suspicious. He noticed that her eyes were bloodshot. Maybe she was really drunk. Kai was not looking forward to the possibility of her getting sick in his car. It was definitely not the way he wanted his first ride to go. He handed her a bottle of water. Would you like some water? Ah! Sia smacked the bottle out of his hand. Okay, Kai thought, there was definitely something wrong with this woman. I'm, I'm sorry, I have no idea why I did that. Um, sure, I'll, I'll take some water. Kai watched in the corner of his eye as she leaned over to grab the bottle from where it landed by her feet. And that's when he noticed them for the first time. Her feet, they pointed backwards. He almost lost control of the car when he saw them. That's when he knew. The woman sitting next to him was a boot. In India, a boot is the spirit of a recently deceased person. Their feet are pointed backwards and always hover above the ground because the earth is too sacred for them to touch. They are also terrified of water. This woman must have died very recently, thought Kai, because she still didn't seem to understand that she was dead. He felt sorry for her, but immediately snapped out of it. He knew that he had to get her out of his car before she realized she was dead. With his right hand still on the wheel, Kai slowly reached over to his door compartment. He carefully unscrewed the top of another bottle of water, slowly, so Sia would not notice. As he did this, Sia continued to rub her neck. She pulled down the visor, brushed aside her thick black hair, and examined her neck in the mirror and screamed. Kai looked over and saw that her neck was completely purple and bruised with a red ring caused from friction. He could see the look of realization wash over Sia's face. Her once timid expression morphed into that of pure, unfiltered fury. She turned her now pitch black eyes toward Kai, just as he sprayed her with the open bottle of water. She yelled in agony as the water burned her skin, and in a few moments, she was gone. Not realizing he had been holding his breath, Kai let out a sigh of relief. His heart was still pounding out of his chest. I'm never driving for car share again, he thought to himself. His hands were shaking, and when he heard the steady drumming of the rumble strip, he realized he was drifting into the shoulder and jerked the car back into his lane. Pay attention, he thought. His eyes darted around the car nervously, and when he was certain that he was completely alone, he began to punch in the directions to head home. Kai was suddenly blinded when some jackass began tailgating him with his brights all the way on. Kai began to speed up to get some distance from the car behind him when he realized he had knocked his rear view mirror out of line when he sprayed the boot. He adjusted the mirror back into place and saw two pitch black eyes staring back at him. The driver who had been tailgating him later reported to authorities that something lunged at Kai before he fishtailed off the road and slammed into a post. There was only one body in the mangled wreck. The next morning, a few miles away, Sia's body was found in the warehouse district. So they say, beware of who you let into your car late at night. 
they just might be a boat. Okay, so she found out that she died recently, right? The whole thing is, why take it out on the person who didn't kill you? That's my thing, like, why take it out on him? He did not kill you. He... Ah, see, maybe. Okay, anybody from India maybe can tell me what... You know what this whole thing is about because I know usually like with Japanese Korean like any Asian story I know if I think in other cultures too if I'm not mistaken um you know if the person who just recently died is angry they come back in revenge and kill anybody who was involved in their death or angered them or just in their presence, they die. But I just want to know why kill somebody that's not that had nothing to do with your recent death. Just wondering. Um, uh, going to the next story, and I think I know who this is by. Wanzi. I almost kidnapped. I I almost kidnapped. I almost kidnapped by strangers with, I think it's supposed to, I was almost kidnapped by strangers with using online transaction. Uh, by Wanzi, of course. I'm 24, and this happened five years ago when I was 19. I was conducting an online transaction on a site called Alx, which is similar to Craigslist. It's an online app where you can see items being sold by random strangers. And all you have to do is make a call and meet up. I was looking for a cheap sweater for my trip to Japan the following week. After several minutes of scrolling, I came across an ad with exactly what I was looking for. A Korean style female fur sweater for just 300 pesos, about $6. It was perfect. I had issue with it. The meetup point was at the LRT train station at 8 p.m because the seller was too busy at work. I First of all, that was a red flag. They asked if can we meet late, like how late? I would've been like, how late you talking? Because I am not meeting you nowhere near two, three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning. Let's go get a swing sweater. If that's the case, you can keep it. I decided, what the heck? It's a public place anyway. I called the owner and we had a quick convo. He sounded like a strict guy, but I asked him when we could meet up. He responded, Tonight at 8 p.m. sharp. I said sure. But this recklessness of mine is what I regret the most. Oh, I arrived at the meeting place at 7.58 p.m. It was really empty, and I was sure I was the only person in the station. It was a cold night in November, and I eagerly awaited warming myself with my coat. Honestly, I'm the kind of girl who's comfortable wearing a sweater even when it's hot. I was sitting on a bench when the clock ticked 8 o'clock, when suddenly someone covered half of my face with a scarf with a really strange scent. I fell unconscious. As I woke up, I found myself in a van with four guys, my wrists handcuffed behind my back. I asked the man what they wanted and to please let me go. Tears began to fall from my eyes. But then, one of the guys touched my face and said, it's our first time ever tasting a beautiful girl like you. I kept on crying and shouted, Please, I want to go home. Please. The guy next to me choked me, shouting that I needed to shut up. I tried to resist, but my eyes started to roll back in my head. He stopped, but it was taking a long time for me to catch my breath. I looked out the window and saw a checkpoint lane. For the first time in my life, I was so glad that the authorities had permission to check the van. But the guy next to me reached for a gun, a really big gun. Knowing this was my only chance, I found the strength to shout and cried out, Officer, please help! They have a gun! The two officers immediately grabbed their guns, one shooting at the tires, the other aiming for the man next to me. The officer shot him in the head. Oh. I never thought I'd witness such a thing in my life. 
One of the officers carried me out of the van, and I passed out moments later. I woke up the next day in a hospital bed. My parents were there, crying and asking me what happened. I told them the truth, that I was buying a sweater online. But I suddenly snapped. I cried and cried saying, please help, please help. Since then, I've had to go to a psychiatrist to recover yeah, from PTSD mental instability and anxiety. And it should go without saying, but I never ever want to buy anything online ever well, again. Well, if you do it online, do it online on a website that's actually, that doesn't have you meet somebody. When I was seven or eight years old, my parents used Okay, so this one is called True Crazy Old Guy by, I guess, Yep, Wazzy. Used to take me to this beach cafe in our town. It had a pool and the cafe was right next to the beach. The family that owned the cafe were my family's close friends, so I spent a lot of my childhood there. The best part about the beach is that when you pass the cafe and the playground, there was a lot of sand and a net for volleyball. As kids, my friends and I would always play there. One ordinary summer night, there was quite a few of us playing in the sand, making castles and doing other things. All of a sudden, I heard a noise behind me in the bushes, right where the sand ended. I should mention that there were woods around the whole place, but it wasn't deep or anything. I was a brave kid, so I just brushed it off as being a cat or animal of some sort and continued to play. However, when I looked up at my friends who were oh, now quiet oh. and staying still, I got the chills. I noticed that all of their eyes had widened. They were staring at me, or rather at whatever was behind me. Yeah. The shock kicked in. And I felt like I was going to faint. Take that sand. I started shaking. I didn't even want to turn around. But when I felt something cold on the back of my neck, that was the last straw. I started running full speed towards the cafe filled with people, and my friends immediately followed behind me. There were six children crying and screaming at the top of our lungs. I remember finally clinging to my mom and crying in her arms. Soon after, the sound of sirens followed by police cars parked in front filled the air. When the adults talked to the police, my friends and I were confused. I still didn't know what was behind me, so I asked my oldest friend in the group who was 10 years old and talking to his dad. It turns out there was this crazy old guy who robbed a lady and stabbed her to death not so far away from here. My friends told me he appeared behind me smiling like a sick clown. He was holding a knife and pressing it against the back of my neck. That must have been the cold thing I felt. From then on, I never stayed far away from the cafe when the sun went down. And thankfully, they caught the guy. <laughs> oh, fuck it. <laughs> okay, guys, so... That was that. At least your friends were with you because if you were by yourself, you would have been in trouble. Maybe if you would have felt the knife on you, you probably still would have ran. But you had sand. You had an advantage. You could have just easily took that sand, turned and said, Woof, or just threw it behind you. Not even, just not even looking. Just threw it behind you, ran to that man's eyes, and then jet it. <laughs> But guys, if you like what you see, give it a like. I will put the original videos and the channel down in the description below. So subscribe to them, subscribe to me, and hit the notification bell. Yeah. Wait, this sound like what 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 this